Mom. What are you doing today? Providence Place, owned by the Sisters of Providence, an ideal rental setting for retirees to continue their active, independent lifestyles. We have bright one and two bedroom apartments, a magnificent chapel with daily mass, restaurant style dining, and wellness and entertainment programs. Call for a tour, 413-534-9700. Call me when you're not so busy. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real, a drive-by Eucharistic procession bringing Jesus to the people in Belchertown. I'm Carolyn McGrath. I'll have the story coming up. I'm Steve Kiltonic in Springfield. While many of us today take voting for granted, there was a time many years ago when women weren't allowed to participate in the voting process. I'll have the story of Susan B. Anthony and her fight for the 19th Amendment. And Dan Dumas takes a look at the latest news from the Diocese of Springfield. These stories are coming your way next on Real to Real. Hello and welcome to Real to Real. The pandemic and the second wave we are now in the midst of has no doubt kept people from attending mass in church with many becoming discouraged with all that's going on. But at St. Francis of Assisi Parish in Belchertown, they have come up with a creative way of bringing Jesus to the people through mobile Eucharistic processions. Carolee McGrath has more. Across Belchertown, people have been watching and waiting in their driveways, not for a birthday parade or a school parade, which have become popular since the pandemic, but for Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Father David Darcy, the pastor of St. Francis of Assisi Parish, is leading a series of mobile Eucharistic processions visiting each neighborhood in the 54 square mile town on Mondays and Wednesdays. During the COVID times that we've been living in with so many people struggling to feel connected to God by not being able to come to church because of their concerns for the virus, so many people have been feeling kind of hopeless and, and lost and the opportunity to bring Jesus in the Eucharist through the neighborhoods and have people feel connected again to our church and to certainly our Lord um, has been an incredible, incredible opportunity. And the, out, the um, response of the people has been tremendous. The procession route, days and times are posted on the parish website and people can't wait to get a glimpse of the Lord. Last March, the pandemic forced the closure of churches for months, but even with them now reopened at a reduced capacity, many are remaining home because of their health conditions. I wanted to see the Eucharistic procession, to see, you know, Jesus in the monstrance. Um, because of my medical conditions and age, I don't actually attend, I watch on TV, so um, I was really glad Kathy Kervick, a mom of four who coordinated the processions, says the idea had been on her heart, knowing so many people in the parish missed being at church. Yes, we're all called to go out and do our part and to be Christ in the world, but sometimes we just need to get out of the way and let Jesus do his thing. So we'll take him to the streets and what he's doing, you know, he'll just do. You know, all we can do is be the instrument or the vehicle to, to get him to that point. The Catholic Church teaches that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. In the Eucharist, we believe in the true presence, which means that Jesus is with us, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Other priests across the country have led similar processions during the pandemic, bringing Jesus on the road. Father Darcy says it's an opportunity to evangelize. For some people that don't understand, I think the curiosity is an opportunity for evangelization anyways. I've watched so many people look over and try and figure out what is going on. And my hope is that it leads to questioning, perhaps question their neighbors, someone that might know, what was that that just happened? And it might lead them to an understanding that this is a great opportunity for outreach for people to get to know the Lord. And he adds, the visible presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is the visible presence of love, which he says the world is desperate for. Especially as we approach the election, along with COVID, there are so many things right now that are, that, are, that are causing just a discontentment among the people in general. There's a lack of respect. There's a lack of simple love. And as we know, that is who God is, love. And 
And the presence of God in this world is a presence of love in this world. And so in the midst of people fighting about issues, fighting about so many things, and losing a sense of respect for each other, the presence of love can be so powerful. And so God still wins in the end, right? And we know that, right? He... God has already conquered this world. That's all we ever have to remember. The Lord has already won. Reporting for Real to Real, I'm Carolee McGrath. What a great spiritual effort. And still to come on Real to Real, Dan Dumas takes a look at the latest news from the Diocese of Springfield. And as we approach Election Day, Steve Kiltonic has the story of a Western Massachusetts native who led the fight in getting women the right to vote. These stories are all still to come on Real to Real. Blessed are they who are poor. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. My passionate brother Terrence Scanlon, your Chalice host, inviting you to take time out of your busy day and join us Sunday morning. We welcome Father Gary Daly as our Mass presider and celebrate the Feast of All Saints. The Chalice of Salvation, your spiritual connection, Sunday mornings at 10 on 22 News and coming up next on Fox 23 WXXA. Providence Place, owned by the Sisters of Providence, an ideal rental setting for retirees to continue their active, independent lifestyles. We have bright one and two bedroom apartments, a magnificent chapel with daily mass, restaurant style dining, and wellness and entertainment programs. Call for a tour, 413-534-9700. Mom, call me when you're not so busy. Butcher, baker, candlestick maker, I didn't care what they grew up to be as long as they were happy. To give up marriage and children just seems like too much to walk away from. He seems to think he's making a real difference in people's lives, and he's so happy. Isn't that what's most important? I never would have imagined our son as a Catholic priest. I'm Dan Dumas with your Real to Real News Briefs. Nearly 100 faithful gathered at Holy Trinity Church in Westfield to join others across the nation in prayer after a 57-day novena. The prayers culminated with a public square rosary that took place across America. Nick Morganelli tells us more. At Holy Trinity Church in Westfield, nearly 100 faithful gathered at the La Salette Garden one of over 20,000 locations for the nationwide public rosary rally on October 10th that brought over 1 million people together in prayer. And we're meeting because America needs prayer. Our Lady Fatima said, pray the rosary for peace. We need peace. We have so much civil unrest, such chaos in our country. Only God can come in and Our Lady is the greatest intercessor to God to bring His peace. Alicia Bellinger, a longtime Westfield parishioner of St. Peter and St. Casimir Parish, has been involved since 2007. Her eight-year-old grandniece Lily was the youngest person to lead a decade. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. It's like what, it's like what my churchy said, if you're like praying the rosary alone, you don't feel like that connection with God. So if you play with a bunch of people, then you have that humongous connection with God and Mary. Be blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. It's much more powerful. You know, it's like a fire. If you make a fire with one log, okay, you have a little fire. Let's add some more logs. We're all logs, and we're making a big, huge bonfire to Mary. Prayers were accompanied by song. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria as well as the beeping of horns as supporters pass by in their cars. World without end. Amen. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Deacon Pedro Rivera, Director of Latino Ministries for the Springfield Diocese, serves parishioners at St. Mary's in Westfield. He led a decade in Spanish. Mary has a 
power of intercession that's incredible. Our mother takes care of us as she took care of her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, more than ever, we really need her intercession because of all the turmoil that's going on. But there's one thing that some of us kind of forget is we need to be what we're praying for. We have to let the Lord change us so that we can have a better world. Mark your calendar for October 16, 2021 to participate or volunteer. Praying in Westfield, I'm Nick Morganelli. Last month, parishes locally and around the world participated in an Adoration and Days of Atonement to heal the world and our nation. Kathy Harrington reports. As COVID-19 continues to spread, closing schools, limiting social gatherings, and dividing the country, and political unrest sparks riots, the tension of daily life in the United States grows. We have to find a way to be at peace together. Whatever it takes, prayer is going to be part of it. In September, across the country and the world, Catholics united with the Jewish faithful for 10 days of atonement. Parish communities signed up, devoting 24 hours of Eucharistic adoration to heal the nation. Sister Cindy Matthews is the pastoral minister at Holy Cross Parish in Springfield. She says there was never any question about her community joining in. You know, every slot is taken. You know, we tried to get two people to come at every hour and spend the hour here. Um, some of them have more or less, but we, we definitely have the coverage that we needed. More than a dozen parishes in western Massachusetts took part over the course of the 10 days. In Munson, it was St. Patrick's. Before the COVID virus closed the churches, Jim and Pat McCarran were regulars at First Friday Adoration. Lifelong parishioners, they signed up to pray for friends, relatives, and even their enemies because they believe prayer will turn things around. We really need healing, and, and I hope it works. I think it will. I don't think it's going to happen all at once, but I'm sure it will. At Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament Parish in Westfield, the responsibility of scheduling and coordinating the 24 hours of adoration was taken on by newly ordained priest, Father Valentine Warren. I'm grateful to God that, that it happened because it's a, a good way, an amazing way for me as a new guy here in the parish to get to um, correspond with the people of the parish and, and to get to um, start working with the parish staff. As the Sunday 11 a.m. Mass came to a close, many parishioners remained behind for the exposition of the Eucharist. The hours were assigned, with some also being covered by the two parish priests and the two deacons. Additionally, Many parishioners returned several times over the 24 hours to pray in the true presence of Christ. We are praying for, for, for healing in our nation, you know, that, that, that the healing and peace will first of all begin among us here in these United States of America, that, you know, we will see each other as brothers and sisters and we will be able to express that love, you know, between one another. And from here, we could bring that same message of peace and unity to the whole world. Wrapping up the first hour of several visits she planned for this extended adoration, parishioner Karen Scahill says prayer is what is needed now. Well, I have great faith in, in Jesus, and I think he's the answer to all our problems. I think we, our country right now is lacking in holiness, and um, we need him more than ever. Scahill says prayer before the Lord is her way, but she believes however others pray, it is time to petition the throne of God to help our nation and our world. In Westfield, I'm Kathy Harrington. And a 24-hour adoration and prayer for our nation will be held in the Diocese of Springfield to coincide with Election Day. We have more information on that at iobserve.org. The parish community of St. Mary's in Hamden came together to remember a young woman who lost her battle with cancer in July. Worcester Bishop Robert McManus, Apostolic Administrator of the Diocese of Springfield, blessed a new statue of Mary purchased by the parish in honor of 25-year-old Amanda Lee, a former altar server and Girl Scout. Carolee McGrath has more. Parishioners of St. Mary's in Hamden gathered outside the church after the 4 p.m. Mass on a recent Saturday to remember one of their own. 25-year-old Amanda Lee passed away in July after an eight-year courageous battle with cancer. 
Worcester Bishop Robert McManus, the Apostolic Administrator of the Diocese of Springfield, celebrated the Mass and blessed a new statue of Mary that was dedicated in Amanda's honor. She decided to go to AIC nursing school uh, to become an oncologist nurse. Who would be better prepared to take care of young kids with cancer than Amanda Lee? The day she died, she got a letter from AIC that she made the dean's list. No accident. No accident. All from God. I agree with you. Amanda was an altar server and a Girl Scout. The parish of St. Mary's came together to raise money to replace an older Mary statue that was moved to nearby St. Mary's Cemetery in Hamden. DJ Landscaping and Dan Isham donated their time and labor to the project. Deacon Leo Coughlin says the entire community wanted to do something to honor the young woman. As Mary said, let your will be done, so did Amanda. I never heard her complain when she was going through chemo and all of that. She just took whatever God gave her, she took. And she always had a smile on her face and just a wonderful, wonderful young lady. She became an altar server for us when she was like third or fourth grade and, and she served for us for five or six years and just always had a smile on her face and always enjoyed coming to church and being close to our Lord and the Blessed Mother. Amanda was the only child of Rose and Matthew Lee. Amanda um, would talk to our friends that were diagnosed with cancer after she was and our family members that were diagnosed with cancer. But Amanda would encourage them to, despite their diagnosis, to go out, have fun, try to make happy memories, live life to the fullest, live in the moment. The inscription on the plaque to be placed by the statue reads, A gentle reminder of our Blessed Mother Mary who said, Lord, let your will be done, as did Amanda. We had a great celebration. There's an obviously Amanda, uh, seems to me without ever me uh, meeting her, just as her mother Rose told me how she accepted this cross. And her mother said, she used to, she'd say, live in the moment. So some days she was very sick. In other days when she was not, she loved life, she lived it to its full, and she, and I think all of this was uh, rooted in her deep Catholic faith. The Wilbraham Hamden Girl Scout Service Unit donated $2,000 to the project. Girl Scouts from Hamden Troop 40160 were in attendance at Saturday's Mass and ceremony. They gave this shout out for Amanda, who served as a role model and who they say fought until the end with grace and great faith in the Lord. Fight for the girl! In Hamden, I'm Carolee McGrath. And remember, you can always stay informed on all the latest news in the Catholic Church locally and beyond by logging on to iobserve.org. There you can read articles written by our Catholic communication staff, as well as view archived episodes of Real to Real. That's iobserve.org. I'm Dan Dumas, and those were your Real to Real news briefs. You are watching Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Here again is your Real to Real host, Sharon Rulier. Well, 100 years ago, the women's suffrage movement was instrumental in getting women the right to vote. One of its leaders, Susan B. Anthony, was born right here in Western Massachusetts. Steve Kiltonic went to her birthplace and has the story of her battle for the 19th Amendment. On August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, essentially providing men and women with equal voting rights. The amendment stated that the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The women's suffrage movement fought for 72 years before the passage of the landmark amendment. One of its pioneering leaders for over half a century was Susan B. Anthony. Anthony was born in this home, in this room in Adams, Massachusetts, which is recognized nationally as the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum. Extensively renovated 10 years ago, the museum is a testament to the suffragist icon who, along with her lifelong friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, founded the National Women's Suffrage Association. Susan B. Anthony was born on February 15, 1820, the second of eight children born to Daniel and Lucy Anthony. Susan was raised in the Quaker faith, 
The meeting house where she and her family worship still stands in the Maple Street Cemetery overlooking Adams. Cassandra Peltier is the executive director of the museum. One of the advantages of the Quaker community was that women and men were considered equal. Peltier said Anthony was influenced from an early age by women in her own family, like her paternal aunt Hannah, who was a Quaker preacher. And Quaker preachers were really community advisors, community leaders. So it was revolutionary for women to hold that position of power um, and, and respect, even in the 1700s. And on the maternal side of the family, Susan's grandmother basically ran the family farm while her husband was at war. So, for different reasons, both sides of Susan's family showed her examples of strong, independent women who were considered equals with their husbands and um, encouraged to take leadership roles. Quakers opposed slavery and supported the abolition and temperance movements. Quakers believe that everyone has the same inner light connecting them to God, so at the most basic level, everyone is created equal. The Anthony's left Adams when Susan was six after her father received an offer to work at a mill in Battenville, New York. In her 20s, Susan became a teacher at Quaker schools in upstate New York. When the family relocated to Rochester, the epicenter of the abolition movement, she met its leaders, Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, for whom she wrote speeches. Anthony, however, became disillusioned. She realized that if she didn't work for women's political rights, any of the reforms that she was passionate about were basically useless for women to work because their voices would not be heard, they would not be taken seriously, and they couldn't vote. Scott Hartbley teaches history courses on American government, social welfare policy, and human oppression at the Elms College. He said in the mid-1800s, women basically had no rights and were subservient to men who owned their property and money. The idea of women voting was seen as a challenge to the institution of marriage. They thought that, that, that women would stop wanting to, to be at home, uh, would stop wanting to be housekeepers, stop wanting to raise their children. Um, some, um, some people thought that women were too weak or not as intelligent or, you know, or not as sophisticated, that kind of thing. It was this whole idea of trying to keep women in their place. In 1851, Anthony's life dramatically changed course when she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton. In 1848, Stanton organized the Seneca Falls Convention, which is recognized as the beginning of the women's suffrage movement. Here, Stanton created the Women's Declaration of Rights, which claimed that all men and women are created equal, including the right to vote. Anthony of Stanton developed a lifelong partnership. According to Peltier, Stanton was seen as the philosopher of the movement, while Anthony, although a great organizer and public speaker, was terrible at composing speeches. She could speak extemporaneously and deliver wonderful speeches, but if she sat down to try and write it in advance, she had a very difficult time. And that's what Elizabeth Cady Stanton was very good at. Stanton had seven children and was married, so Susan traveled around the country giving as many as 100 speeches a year for the women's suffrage movement. They published a weekly women's rights newspaper, The Revolution, which advocated for equality of all races and genders. In 1869, they founded the National Women's Suffrage Association. Anthony was arrested for voting illegally in the 1872 presidential election and convicted in a widely publicized trial. She was fined $100, but never paid. In 1878, Anthony and Stanton presented Congress an amendment giving women the right to vote, but it was defeated. In 1890, after disagreement over the 15th Amendment, which granted black men the right to vote, Anthony's group merged with the American Women's Suffrage Association. Women of all backgrounds started to take up the cause. They worked at the state levels, and within six years, four western states granted women the right to vote. You know, there were sort of various degrees of voting, meaning in some states some women could vote, but it depended if they owned property or what kind of a job they had. As the new century approached, more states began to grant women the right to vote. Anthony and Stanton served as role models for younger women. One of the things that was really important for them was inspiring the next generation of women. Um, Susan B. Anthony was known as Aunt Susan to younger women who were in the suffrage movement. She was constantly writing back and forth with women in colleges, encouraging them to educate themselves on political processes. Neither Stanton or Anthony lived to see the 19th Amendment become law. Susan died on March 13, 1906, at 86. 
Neither one of them had any doubt that women would get the right to vote in the United States. It was just a matter of when. After her death, women began to picket and march more frequently in parades in cities like New York, Washington, and Philadelphia. So women were marching with their babies in strollers. They were walking their young children um, hand in hand. They had sort of uh, choruses of young girls um, performing or walking along in costume. The white dresses um, were a way to look more feminine since a lot of women who supported suffrage were seen as very masculine and threatening. As World War I began, legislatures in the House and Senate started to get more pressure from their constituents to enact a law. At the same time, the suffrage movement found an ally in President Woodrow Wilson. For him it was the war, you know, the World War I, and women's involvement in work. Um, and suddenly they, they were taking on kind of different roles and that it helped the overall, overall war effort, effort and that um, okay, now they have a right to vote, you know, that they're, 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 they're equal to men. An amendment had to first pass Congress and then be ratified by three-quarters of the states. When New York became the first eastern state to pass a referendum, a domino effect took place. After Tennessee signed on as a 36th state, the 19th Amendment was made official on August 26, 1920. Over 8 million women voted for the first time in the presidential election that November. It took nearly four years and a million dollars to renovate the Anthony Birthplace Museum, which reopened its doors in 2010. Its five rooms take visitors through Anthony's early days in Adams through her many years as activist. The museum exists to preserve the property in the house and obviously the collection and just raise awareness about Susan B. Anthony's legacy. Um, even folks who live locally sometimes don't know that she was born here. What is Anthony's legacy? The majority of people I know, you know, look at her as a pioneer, look at her as someone who was ahead of her time, who had um, an unusual ability to see the big picture and then zoom in on, you know, the, the little things that she could do to work towards the better future that she saw. Before COVID-19 hit, there were plans in Adams to honor Anthony with a parade and fireworks on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. While those plans are on hold, a statue of Anthony commissioned by the town is still under wraps on the town common. It features Anthony giving a speech, and at the bottom of the stairs is Susan as a child reading. The, the story is that she learned to read at the age of three, um, and she was always precocious and trying to do all the things that girls weren't supposed to do. The statue is a fitting reminder of the crusading woman who fought so tirelessly and for so long on behalf of women's rights for the generations that followed. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic. The Anthony Museum has reopened to public tours with admission by online reservation only. We have a link at iobserve.org. For this week, that's Real to Real. A programming note for our viewers on WWLP Channel 22 in Springfield, next Saturday, Reel to Reel will be preempted due to NBC programming. All other viewers will see a special encore edition of Reel to Reel. But remember, as always, you can keep up with all of the latest news on the Catholic Church, both here in the Diocese of Springfield and around the world by heading over to our news and information site, iobserve.org. You can also connect there to our Catholic Communications YouTube page where you will find archived stories and episodes of Real to Real. It's all found through a link at iobserve.org. And you can also like us on Facebook at Catholic Communications. And remember to set your clocks back this weekend. I will see you right back here in two weeks for a new edition of Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal, and the support of you, our faithful viewers.